can't think as people do. The machine is different. Alex, if you want to pass that rock around, now is the time to do it. Um, I'm passing a very boring looking rock around. Um, the important thing is to hold it, because you will be among just a few thousand people on the planet who can say they have done so. But I'll get back to that um, later. Um, it's beautiful, did you say? I don't think that applies to the speaker tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, I'm a newcomer to science on screen, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, but if, as is announced here, it's the unexpected pairings of feature film or documentary with renowned experts from the world of scientific and medical research, I'm afraid you may be in for a disappointment. Um, the only word on, in that sentence that is applicable to my presence here tonight is the first one, <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to seeing it again. Um, nor am I an expert on, his, on, the, on the movie Star, or even Mount Rushmore in the back hills of South Dakota, where the film's exciting climax was reputedly shot. Um, in fact, this is not the case. It was filmed in the Hollywood soundstage because the National Park Service refused to give permission for an attempted murder to be filmed on the faces of the presidents. However, I have been to Mount Rushmore, twice in fact, um, and Mount Rushmore is famous for its geology, and I'm a geologist, so I have some link there. And I may also have a connection to the movie's male star, who, as you all know, is Cary Grant, um, with whom I don't just share an accent, but was told as a child was a relative of mine. Um, I seriously doubt whether that's true, but he was born Archibald Leach, which is my mother's maiden name, and you may not be able to see it, but he bore a striking resemblance to my uncle, Michael Leach, who, like his famous father, Bernard Leach, was a potter, as was Cary Grant's grandfather, so who knows? <laughs> And as I say, I have been to Mount Rushmore twice, but the first time was way back in 1981, uh, at which time I'd only been in the country six months or so, and I didn't recognize any of the faces, nor did I know they were presidents. So we can scratch that one. Uh, but the last time was just this past summer, uh, and so now I am more familiar with the faces. And, as you may know, the monument was sculpted by the Danish-American Gutzon Borglum and his son Lincoln between 1927 and 1941. Uh, but what you see today was not what was originally envisaged. The idea of carving the likenesses of famous people into the rocks of the Black Hills was conceived by the historian Dwayne Robinson as a means of promoting tourism. Uh, but his idea was to sculpt the needles, which lie about 10 miles southwest of Mount Rushmore, and not with faces of the presidents, but with famous Western characters, uh, such as Buffalo Bill. Um, Borland rejected this idea uh, in favor of Mount Rushmore because the rocks at Mount Rushmore uh, were of better quality and because there was strong opposition to the Needles site from Native Americans. 
for whom the Needles was a sacred place and who viewed um, the entire idea, understandably, as an abomination. But what possessed people to want to make great monuments in the Black Hills? Uh, the answer to this, of course, is, lies in the geology, which dates back billions of years to the very formation of North America as a continent. Um, and it is this story that I'd like to um, tell you about tonight. <coughs> the Mount Rushmore, and of course much of the Black Hills, is made of granite, um, which has been used or prized for its durability and strength since the time of the ancient Egyptians, and formed uh, from the slow cooling of a molten rock or magma, granite seen here is a coarse textured igneous rock comprising interlocking crystals of glassy quartz, white felspar, and black and silvery micas. Available in great big chunks, it's long been used as a building stone and has been used in some of the world's most famous monuments. Look, for example, at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., or a little closer to home on the facade of Copeland Hall and the Computer Service Center. But Mount Rushmore is not just any granite. It is renowned worldwide for its spectacular white veins of a rock type known as pegmatite, which we can see here crisscrossing the faces of the president. Pegmatite is a rare uh, an unusual rock that sometimes forms during the very last stages of granite crystallization when the melt has become rich in fluids which allow minerals in the magma to be very rapidly transported to the sites of growing crystals as a result of which the, the crystals can grow to very large sizes um, and are often rather beautifully formed and we can see some spectacular great crystals here. Now, pegmatites are much sought after by both geologists and collectors because they often contain very rare minerals and gemstones, such as the black tourmaline we can see here, there's a hammer for scale, but also minerals like topaz, aquamarine, beryl, uh, and even tin and tungsten minerals. But geology is not about rocks, contrary to public opinion. <laughs> and if there's a take-home message that the rock that's being passed around uh, is to make, uh, is just that. Geology is not about rocks, it's about the stories they tell. Um, and the Black Hills of South Dakota are a case in point. The granite of Mount Rushmore, which is known as the Harney Peak granite, is not just an unusual granite, it's also a very ancient one, having crystallized 1,715 million years ago. And it intrudes into yet older rocks, which were once sediments and date back more than 2 billion years. These rocks tell the story of the assembly of North America as a continent um, and the history that came thereafter. Now, the Black Hills, which are here, are part of one of the oldest pieces of crust in America, which is known as the Wyoming province, and here are the edges. It underlies much of Montana and Wyoming and contains rocks that go back three and a half billion years to the dawn of North America as a continent. They are exposed now in a number of fault blocks, which we see here, one of which is the Black Hills. Now the Wyoming province in turn, here it is, is the most accessible of several very ancient pieces of crust shown here in pink that today make up the core of North America, 
but which were once scattered across the face of the globe as separate continents separated by wide oceans. As these oceans closed, the blocks slowly came together, their collisions forming a succession of mountain belts, which are shown here in orange. Of course, these belts are not high mountain ranges anymore because they formed so long ago that they've been completely eroded away. But once they were, and the rocks they exposed tell us just that. The oldest of these mountain ranges, way up here, formed between 2 and 1.9 billion years ago when a small continent known as the Slave Province here collided with that of the Ray Hearn to form a little belt up here known as the Thelon Belt in northernmost Canada. Then, about 1.85 billion years ago, another continental block known as the Superior Pro Province collided with that of the Nain to produce an amalgamation over on this side. And finally, between about 1.85 and 1.75 billion years ago, the amalgamated eastern and western provinces collided with each other, producing the great Trans-Hudson mountain belt, which would have rivaled the Himalayas. With the formation of this mountain belt, the core of what was to become North America was assembled. And the Black Hills, which are located here, provide a unique record of this assembly and the history that followed it. But interestingly, it was not just North America that assembled at this time. All of the continents came together so that between about 1.8 and 1.4 billion years ago, we had a single landmass or supercontinent called Columbia. And here it is. Now, you may not be aware of this, but supercontinents are enormously important in Earth history because their assembly and subsequent breakup controls just about everything. Not just the rock record, but sea level, the composition of the atmosphere, the chemistry of ocean water, global climate, even the evolution of life. And if you read the brief bio accompanying the poster uh, announcing tonight's event, you will know that I have a, a special interest in supercontinents. Way back in 1982, my OU colleague Tom Worsley and I proposed a supercontinent cycle whereby Earth history was viewed as having been punctuated by the repeated assembly and breakup of supercontinents with profound consequences to planetary evolution. This is a timeline down here, back to three billion years. And based on data that was available back then, we proposed the existence of six supercontinents. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, while we tried to convince our colleagues of both the existence and importance of the supercontinent cycle, um, our ideas were largely rejected. In fact, I once remember telling Tom, after presenting our case to the Geological Society of America, that I felt like I was looking down the barrels of the guns of the USS Iowa. <laughs> but unlike Paul Wagner, who died in Greenland without ever knowing that his idea of continental drift, which was likewise rejected by his contemporaries, would one day be vindicated in the theory of plate tectonics. We've seen the supercontinent cycle, on the other hand, become mainstream science. Of the five supercontinents we actually predicted, four of them now have names. Pinocha, sorry, that's Pangaea. Pinocha, Rodinia, Columbia, and Kenneland, and at more or less the same times, or the times we envisage. In fact, over the past decade, the idea of a supercontinent cycle has gone totally viral. Um, as this chart rather dramatically illustrates, uh, this was obtained simply by doing a Google Scholar search using the keyword supercontinent cycle 
and noting the publication year of the papers listed. And it shows both the 15-year hiatus between our initial presentation of the idea and any number of, any significant number of papers on the subject, other than our own, which are these little orange ones here. <laughs> and the amazing way the idea has taken off since the millennium. But I digress. Back in the Black Hills, uh, the Himalayan mountain belt that formed when North America came together 1.8 million years ago was entirely eradicated by over a billion years of erosion. That is, until about 500 million years ago, when sea level rose and sediment was deposited over the top of that eroded landscape. This produced one of the cornerstones of North American geology, known as the Great Unconformity, along which beach sandstones were deposited on upended, eroded, and weathered sediments, which are one and a half billion years older. The unconformity itself represents the land surface at that time, a buried landscape, an ancient landscape, that was buried 500 million years ago. Sedimentation then continued for more than 400 million years, producing a spectacular sequence of rocks with wonderfully evocative names, starting here with the beach sandstones of the Deadwood Formation 500 million years ago. These are overlain by a thick succession of fossiliferous limestones the deposition of which indicates shallow marine conditions. These were deposited in warm, shallow seas over a period of in excess of 100 million years. The bright red sandstones of the Spearfish Formation preserve fossil sand dunes and tell the story of the development of a vast desert 240 million years ago. the rippled sandstone of the Jurassic Sundance Formation are marine deposits and contain fossil dinosaur tracks. This is the real Jurassic world. These and younger sandstones of the Dakota Formation hold up the Dakota Hogback, a sharp ridged feature that surrounds the whole of the Black Hills and on top of which are marine shales that contain beautiful fossils of an extinct group of mollusks known as ammonites, which died out at the same time as the dinosaurs. And then finally, about 70 million years, or at least starting about 70 million years ago, during an event known as the Laramide, stresses from the closing Pacific Ocean off here to the west caused block faulting across several of the mountain states. In South Dakota, one such fault uplifted the entire sedimentary package shown here in colors, which was then eroded away to reveal the ancient crustal rocks on which those sediments were deposited. And this leaves us with the Black Hills that we know today, which are an elongate domal feature with a core of ancient crustal rocks shown here in pink into which the Hanley Peak granite was intruded but are mantled in turn by beach sandstones, the marine limestones of the limestone plateau shown in green, the desert sandstones of the Red Valley shown in pink and completely surrounding the Black Hills the marine sandstones of the Dakota Hogback with the black shales beyond. All told, a history that tells a story that spans more than two billion years. <laughs> <laughs> so bear this in mind as you watch tonight's movie. Um, and if you have the opportunity to go to Mount Rushmore, I encourage you to look at not just the faces of the presidents, 
but what can be seen from the other side of the mountain. Thank you very much.